When it comes to chasing the mysterious muskox on a frozen island in the Bering Sea, the real challenge has little to do with hunting as you might know it. It was the cold as you see it. Minus 30. With temperatures that can drop wildly below zero and weather that can strand you for days on end, this hunt has a lot more to do with survival than it does with shooting. But if you can keep a level head and warm fingers, there will be plenty of meat to go around. I'm Steven Ronella. To me, hunting isn't only about the pursuit of an animal. It's about who we are and what we're made of. I live to hunt and hunt to live. I am a meat eater. Forty miles off the mouth of Alaska's Yukon River in the Bering Sea, the land of Nunavak Island can be almost indistinguishable from the surrounding ocean thanks to the thick layers of ice and snow. It's here that I've come to hunt the strange and the woolly muskox. The Chupik Eskimos have lived on Nunavak for thousands of years. At European contact, they were a plentiful people, living in a dozen or more villages along the island's coast. But waves of epidemics swept across the island following outside contact, killing three-fourths of the Chupik. How many people live in the village? 200? About 200. About 200? Maybe less than 200 right now because of the winter season. Oh, yeah. Were you born, you were born here on the island? Yes, sir. Yeah. Now the remaining residents, numbering around 200, live on the island's only village, Makoriuk. The Chupik live a subsistence lifestyle, driving food through reindeer herding, salmon fishing, berry picking, and hunting seal and walrus. Most of the cash on the island comes from commercial halibut harvests, and in the winter, muskox hunts. If you had to pick between seal, reindeer, and muskox, which would you pick? I'll pick walrus. You like walrus more? Yeah. You like, you like walrus or no? Yeah, I like walrus. Nunavak muskox tags are awarded through Alaska's big game lottery draw. On any given year, you've got less than a 5% chance of drawing one. And if you do get one, you will need to hire a Chupik transporter or guide. James Whitman is mine. <laughs> He works with his close friend and relative, assistant guide Raymond Amos. Both were born on Nunavak and have hunted and fished their entire lives. We sat down to go over the hunt plan. When we take off tomorrow morning, our first stop will be up on the hill up here. It's about five miles from here. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we'd go down into the next bay. You just got your glass from the high spots? Yeah. And you're looking miles or? Yeah, miles, yep. Okay. Then we'll go in the bay and go up the other valley, then we'll stay close to the coast. And every other hill or where the vantage point is really good will glass. Mm -hmm. Is it specific places you routinely find the animals? My favorite spot was always going west. That's harbor and beyond because there was always a lot of animals over there. So what time will we head out tomorrow morning? Daylight. Despite the dangerously cold conditions, there's all manner of interesting things going on out here, and I want to see as much of village life as possible. Most urgent has to do with the foxes, both arctic and red, that move into the town's edges after the annual reindeer slaughter. You know, you could uh, cut some antlers from here and take them home. Oh, yeah? yeah I got a lot free. of these things. They're free. This is the reindeer butchering grounds. Herders from the village drive the animals onto the ice of this frozen lake and then slaughter them with headshots. The remains are left scattered about to be claimed by the lake's bottom after the spring thaw. I have this macabre fantasy of diving into this lake and swimming above the chaotic tangle of antler and bone that must have accumulated there after so many decades of use. It's an easy meal for the resident red foxes as well as arctic foxes that arrive in the winter from across the sea ice. So these foxes come off the ocean, huh? Yeah, they originally come from the mainland. And they walk on the ice and they come out from here. Do you only see them in the wintertime? Oh, yeah. Just wintertime? Yeah. Really?
That's a big red fox. Oh, yeah. They, they, they even get bigger than this. Really? Oh, yeah. In my high school and college years, I trapped fox and sold the pelts into the commercial markets, never once keeping a hide for myself. Man, that's a nice fox. But now that I'm older and have the luxury, I'm gonna save this fox in order to have something beautiful made for my wife. Kinda big for you, huh? Oh, it's so much bigger than a Michigan fox. My nephew James, he cut one that's for tall as me, from the tail to the head. Yeah, this is not like a normal fox. They're the biggest red fox on this the whole wor world. There's nothing eating them out here. No. They don't have coyotes and wolves killing them. So far, this has been a surprising and productive trip. As long as this weather holds, we'll be getting after some much bigger game tomorrow. Human activity on Nunavak Island is not governed by the time of the day or the day of the week. It's governed by weather. The next morning's forecast puts a halt to our plans. Things seem fine here in Macquarie, but the southern half is covered in clouds with whiteout conditions. It's a no travel day. We move to plan B. We're gonna kill a little time by going down. They're gonna show me how the Eskimos catch fish through the ice in the wintertime. We head to a spot so close to the village that I expect to spud through the ice and hit a sidewalk. We don't find any existing holes, so we start from scratch. And I wear a hole through my beaver mitten before we hit open water. I guess Wisconsin caught beaver are no match for bearing sea ice. You get through? Yeah. Three. Oh! So that's the rig there for Tom Cod. This no is the rig for Tom Cod. Snap swivel, banana weight, a little bit of leader, split shot, beads, and a treble hook. Quit drop it in there. Did you hit bottom? You're kidding me. <laughs> there you go, guys. <laughs> this is a regular Tom Cod from Macquarie, Alaska out on Nunavak Island in the Bering Sea. That was fast. This is what Steve's going for. There he is. Hey. Oh, fatty. Tap him on the head. You got the two big ones, Steve. There you go. If I lived here, I wouldn't get anything done. I'd always be down here. If my wife had divorced me, I'd just be out here. This is my new favorite activity. I keep wanting the fish to stop hitting, but I think they're just gonna keep going. You're gonna have to tie me up to that snow machine and drag me out of here, you know that? I can't, I, it's like I can't walk away from a hot hole. <laughs> so tell me what all those fish are good for. Well, we'll cook them, boil them, really good with seal oil and pepper. Or we'll freeze it and we'll eat it frozen with seal oil. And another thing we do with them too during the summer if we have them is we dry them. Whole like this, you gut them and the ladies will braid through the gills here and dry them. That's how you dry them. Hold to hold them all together. Yeah. You think we can find some seal oil to dip the frozen fish in? We got some seal oil. Do you? Yeah. I'd love to try that. You say it's an acquired taste, huh? Yeah. Well, I'm going to acquire it right now. Don't eat too much of it because it'll give you the run.
Now and then, you see a hunter or fisherman clean something and you just know they've done it hundreds of times. Something about the fluidity and knowingness of their motions. It's like poetry written with a blade, and I'm seeing it here. That's like nothing I've ever eaten in my entire life. And the meat tastes like it's sweet, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. I think it's the combination between the two, the seal oil and the fish, that makes it yeah. taste like that. No, I can get used to that. It does make the meat taste sweet. Yeah, it does. There's nothing like that. I mean, I've eaten all manner of things. I've never tasted anything like that. James explains to me that his ancestors would suffer starvation if they ate nothing but tomcod, even if they had all they could eat. But tomcod and seal oil together keep you alive. I ponder the synergy of those two items, and it makes me think of my own relationship to fishing. I love catching fish, and I love eating yeah, fish, like but on its own, it's not enough. There needs to be some mammal in the mix, some hunting. And tomorrow, that's what's going to happen. Lord Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything you have done for us and also bring us back safely without any problems or trouble. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Okay, let's go do it. Today the weather is on our side. We're finally able to hit the tundra. and new to these animals, I have no real idea what to expect. But I get the impression that when James and Raymond get a window with the right weather, they leave home with little doubt that they're gonna return with a muskox. It's dangerous out here, and they don't seem to relish the idea of whiling away time in these conditions with nothing to show for it. Man, you boys live on a cold looking island. Coldest month is February. And then March is usually the stormy month. When does the ice go out? Better part of April. Yeah. 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 But it looked like this year it's going to be early because it's not frozen solid. When do the whales and seals and stuff start coming by? As soon as it breaks up? Yeah. yeah. Once we're out on the land, I begin to understand James and Raymond's cockiness about getting the bowl today. With the open expanses lacking any sort of thick vegetation or timber or deep canyons, Finding the animals seems like a matter of simply covering lots of ground. Success rates on this hunt are high, because as long as you can wait for the right weather, you'll have a good chance of finding an animal. And no one with the dedication to come all the way here does so with limited time. And before long, sure enough, we find some. There's four. There's some muskox out there a few miles out. Hard to say from here what they are. They're very far away. Too big for Kozimik. Too big and too dumumuk. Yeah. So I guess you can dumb out and I talk and I guess we're gonna guess good maybe talk a little bit in my yuk. Okay. Okay. Well, let's just hope they're bulls. It's a one bull with all kinds of women with him. Oh, I see, yeah. Three cows. Three cows and a bull. Yeah, once you get up close, it's pretty easy to tell. Yeah. It's a nice, mature bull. It looks very symmetrical.
Oh. Is it clear? No. Surprisingly, shooting a musk ox is not as easy as you might think. Man, that clumping up is just the best defense, man. Yeah, I do. Their only real defense is to huddle together in a tight group, which works well against their traditional predators, wolves. But it's easy to see how indiscriminate hunting with firearms would lead to near extinction 150 years ago. Today, there are very strict regulations on musk ox hunting, which means I have to take extra care to make sure I have a clear shot on only the bull. But still, in all honesty, it's as much a harvest as a hunt. The chase is a prolonged series of stops and starts that lasts a good 40 minutes as I continually have to get into position and then wait for an opportunity. Finally, when I'm starting to think that this is never gonna work, a narrow opening presents itself. My shot puts the bull down hard, but then he's right back on his feet and huddled into the cows like nothing happened. Even though I studied for this, the anatomy of these strange and woolly creatures is hard to read. This time, clean lung. As I walk up, I really am honestly kind of blown away by the size and beauty of this creature. What an animal. I feel like I'm looking at something thrust unexpectedly into my world from some far away, unknown place. Congratulations. This is a fine animal. That's a big bull? Yep. Holy smokes. How old is a bull like that? I wouldn't say this, probably eight, eight year old. It's had three chicks. <laughs> No problem. Here's the bullet hole. Yeah, a little far forward. You're trying to shy away from those other animals. Yeah. I, I think it kind of subconsciously moves you away from where you're supposed to be. Nice and clean, I like it. Let me see that thing, Raymond. Stuff I like right there. Cut a big old hatch in there, huh? I've seen a lot of people gut a lot of things, but that's I've never seen that way before. I like that. It's a good looking heart. There you go. After a long, cold day, what could be better than a stew? Plenty of fresh killed meat, hearty vegetables like carrots, onions, and potatoes, a good broth. It's just what you dream of eating as the wind chills your lungs and numbs your fingers. All right. That 
looks good. My first musk ox. Thank you, Ram. Oh, it's very good. It's a very distinct flavored meat. You know, like the texture, of, not the flavor, the texture. Flavor is very good, but the texture is like, it's just like I said, it's like a dense kind of meat, you know? Mm -hmm. Man, that's good. You know, only a handful of times in my life I've ever gone on a, like a guided hunt. But it's been great with you guys because you've taken time to explain the process and put up with all my questions about Chupic life, the deep, deep history you have. It's been very educational for me to come here and, and see how you guys live. What makes me really happy, you sharing the meat. The more you share, the more blessing comes down to you. Well, thank you, Raymond. I'm gonna make this same thing for my kids, they'd love it. 